So a person doesn't feel well, sometimes short of breath, they walk up hills and it isn't like they used to be, they're 70 years old. So they come for an evaluation. Is this something wrong with my heart? So we do a stress echo and we see that the heart isn't moving like it should, which means there's something wrong with a certain area of the heart. So then they do an angiogram and the doctor says, yep, we found a 96% stenosis of this particular coronary artery. And then they say to them uh, almost the same words every time. If this blocks any worse, you're going to have a heart attack and die. Now let's think about this for a little bit, because this is 90% of the procedures in this country are done with exactly these people. So here's a 75-year-old guy, not in the greatest shape, but, you know, he's okay. He's walking up hills and he feels a little funny. If he's got 4% blood flow to a major part of his heart, and that's all that the blood flow is to your heart, is through these major vessels, then my question is, if you've got 4% blood flow, how are you even standing or sitting, let alone more or less normally walking up hills? If that was the real issue here, how is that even possible? Welcome to the Wise Traditions Podcast, sponsored by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food, Farming, and the Healing Arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. I'm your host, Hilda Labrada-Gore. This is episode 59, and my guest is Dr. Tom Cowan. He is a holistic physician with a private practice in San Francisco. He is also an author whose latest book, Human Heart, Cosmic Heart is the focus of our conversation today. He has tremendous insights on how the heart works and how to best treat and prevent cardiovascular disease and heart attacks in particular. Tom's theories are unorthodox and intriguing. This conversation will most certainly change your understanding of the cause and treatment of heart attacks, and it just might save your life. Before we dive into the conversation, we want to recognize our sponsors. Wise Traditions is supported in part by the Nutritional Therapy Association, real education for people who believe in real food. Go to nutritionaltherapy.com and Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant, the probiotic everyone's talking about. Go to thriveprobiotic.com. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So you said something rather shocking to me recently. You said that most doctors and the general population believe that heart attacks are caused by a blockage of an artery, and yet you you challenge that theory. Tell me why. So just to put that in perspective, the question is about heart attacks, and just uh, to broaden it a little bit, we're talking about heart disease, but... There's lots of different kinds of heart disease. There's arrhythmias and congestive heart failures and myocarditis and all different ones. So we're not talking about any of those. We're talking about the spectrum of angina, which means chest pain from the heart, unstable angina, which just means worse chest pain from the heart, and heart attacks. So we're not talking about any rhythm problems or anything. That's a totally different subject. Now, I would say that what we're talking about is 95% of what we call heart disease. Mm-hmm. So all the people who are, have heart disease, heart attacks, etc., all the people who are getting stents, angioplasties, bypasses, taking Lipitor, or eating low-fat diet, those are the people we're talking about. Okay. And that's the disease we're talking about, just to be very clear on that. And so... Starting in around the 40s and then going into the 50s, there was the so-called thrombogenic theory of heart disease, which is that we have, depending on who you listen to, anywhere from two to four major coronary arteries. Even heart attacks are now called coronaries, referring to the coronary arteries. Right. The theory, the thrombogenic theory of heart disease or heart attacks is that you have these four major blood vessels. That's where all of the blood flow to the heart comes from. And over time, you get atherosclerosis, which means plaque formation. 
and it eventually blocks one of these major arteries. Therefore, the blood can't get through because of the blockage. Mm -hmm. And then downstream, downstream from the blockage, there's a deficiency of blood flow. And then you get what's called ischemia, which first shows up as pain, and then worse pain. And then it actually destroys the tissue because of the lack of blood flow, meaning the lack of oxygen and food to those heart cells. Mm -hmm. And that theory is why we do bypasses, because we bypass the blocked area. That theory is why we do angioplasties, which is like a roto-rooter, rooting out that uh, area of blockage, and we put a stent in, which is like a cuff that keeps the area open. That theory is why there were low-fat diets saying it reduced the plaque buildup, Mm -hmm. That theory is why people were given Lipitor, because if you reduce the cholesterol, that's what the plaque is, even though now we know that's not what the plaque is. But we used to think that's what the plaque is. So if you give somebody a statin drug and reduces the cholesterol, the plaque will go away, uh, or at least not get any worse. So it's the entire theory in both the conventional medical world and the alternative world. I mean, the alternative world... The only thing they've ever had to offer in the last 40 years was so-called chelation therapy, uh -huh. which is because you chelate or bind the stuff in the plaque and then restore the blood flow. So that's the thrombogenic theory. And I learned about 10, 15 years ago that it turns out, like a lot of things in medicine and the heart, and the heart in particular, that it may not be the truth. Whoa, that's mind-blowing, just because that's what we've been told for so long. It's Yes, it's ingrained. like mother's milk. Yeah. Nobody doesn't believe it's the plaque. Mm -hmm. every, every, the whole diet heart hypothesis was all about the plaque. Mm -hmm. Everything in cardiology is about the plaque. And we're talking about a trillion-dollar business wow. of unblocking plaque. Now, if you want, I can walk you through how I came to believe that it wasn't the whole story. Oh, yeah. So the first thing I started thinking is, okay, and I didn't, of course, make this up by myself. I was sent an, e an email about 12 years ago from a guy in, in Brazil whose father-in-law was the head of cardiology in the Brazilian hospital, and he was a heretic about this and said, this thrombogenic theory is not right. There's a whole different way of looking at it. And because of this different way of looking at it, there's actually a medicine that will dramatically reduce the incidence of heart attacks and deaths from heart attacks with very little fuss and little intervention. And I, when I first heard that, I thought, no, this is crazy. Uh -huh. But I asked him to send me whatever he, information he had. So I got a box of stuff, books and articles in Portuguese, which I couldn't read, but I could read enough of it to s spend another number of years trying to figure out whether this guy was right or not. So here's what I came up with. The first thing is, I think we would all agree that if the problem is plaque, then the plaque must come from something in the blood, right? Mm -hmm. It's There's no there's nowhere else it could come from, and everybody agrees with that. It, it, most people would say it's too much LDL, a type of cholesterol in the blood. Or some people would say too much inflammation in the blood. But in any case, we all agree that it's something in the blood. Right. So then the next question I ask myself, which is obvious, is the blood in the coronary arteries where this plaque is formed, is it the same blood as in the artery leading to your spleen? I know the answer. Yes. Yes. Right. right. <laughs> How about to your leg in the femoral artery? Same. Same. The blood is the blood everywhere. Therefore, if there's something forming plaque in your coronary arteries, it will also form plaque in your splenic artery. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we do get plaque in our splenic artery, of which there's only one. So plaque in the coronary arteries, plaque in the splenic arteries, plaque in the femoral artery to your foot. Now, here's the next question. How many people do you know who've had heart attacks? Lots. Right. Bill Clinton, Dick Cheney, Aunt Bessie, you know, Uncle Fred, everybody. Everybody knows somebody personally or 
with somebody famous who's had a heart attack. Next question. How many people do you know have had spleen attacks? Nobody. Nobody. I was an ER doctor for 10 years. I've asked thousands of people in lectures, besides one guy who said it, he knew somebody with a spleen attack, which turns out he had a gunshot wound to his spleen. Oh. Which is, I mean, you can get an injury to your spleen, and you can get diseases to your spleen, mm -hmm. right? But it's not a spleen attack from just restricted blood flow. The only two organs, there's no spleen attacks, there's no liver attacks, there's no kidney attacks, there's no foot attacks. Only two organs have attacks, the brain and the heart. That's right. The brain we call strokes and the heart we call heart attacks. Mm -hmm. No other organs. So why is that? If everywhere gets plaque, you know, what's the problem here? So that points the finger at the, there must be something different about those two organs, not the plaque not right. the blood flow. So then that, that set me thinking. And then I said, okay, it turns out that in the 40s and 50s when this thrombogenic theory started coming about, most of the cardiologists said, it's not true. That's not what causes heart attacks. So as a result, there have been a number of studies over the year investigating two things. One is if somebody has a heart attack and die, they look at the artery leading to that part of the heart, find out if it had plaque, uh -huh. right? The other thing they do is they have people who die of accidents who are young and healthy, and they say, how many of those people have plaque? Mm -hmm. And all these articles are on my website, the humanheartcosmicheart.com, because I don't want anybody to take my word for it. It's a big subject, controversial. Sure. So we posted all these articles. So it turns out there are studies that range anywhere from 18% of people who have heart attacks have a over 90% stenosis, meaning 90% blockage, which is when it's considered clinically significant. 18%. Uh -huh. And these are the people who die within one hour after having a heart attack. Now, most people don't die right away. They live for a day or a week or a month. And so when you get people who've lived like a week, you'll find studies that show up to 78%. So in other words, the longer you live after you have a heart attack, the more likely you are to have a significant stenosis in that part of your heart, uh -huh. blockage. There's a number of questions that arise from this. And again, over this 40 years or 50 years of study, that's the range of numbers. So the first one says, so if it's 18% had a blockage, well, what happened to the other 82%? Right. They didn't have a blockage. So why, why did they, they have, have a heart, heart attack? attack? Yeah. So, and then if, even if it's 78%, this, the first question, well, what happened to the 22%? Uh -huh. Because now we're told if you have an angiogram and you have clear coronary arteries, you're completely safe. But we know that even at best case scenario, you still have a 22% chance of having a heart attack. Interesting. And the other thing that, that those studies clearly suggest is that the incidence of blockages goes up the longer you live after you have a heart attack until you die. So that suggests that the blockage is a consequence of the heart attack, not the cause. Ah. If, in other words, if you have somebody who dies right away and then you get a fresh look at what, what their situation was before the heart attack, it's in the 20s or 30s. Even one was 18. Uh -huh. And if you wait, then something must have happened to cause blockages after the fact, uh -huh. which of course then begs the issue of what happened before the fact. Right. I mean, that's the whole question. Here. Exactly. There's a great website that people should look at who are interested in this, which is called heartattacknew.com. And he has a video that explains a lot of things. And in the print version, which is at the bottom, there's a book by an Italian pathologist named Baroldi who spent 40 years doing autopsies and pathological examinations of people who died of heart disease. This guy knows more about what happened to these people by miles than anybody alive. So the people say, oh, there's no research on this. There is a 170 
boring page book <laughs> that if you're a glutton for scientific punishment with thousands of references, every single study that's ever been done, some of them by him. Uh -huh. So one of them was, if you take people who are in their 40s and 50s and they have some other non-heart disease like asthma or diabetes or arthritis or sinus infection, 66% of them who die of accidental death will have a greater than 90% stenosis of one of their major coronary arteries. So what's the significance of that? So they're walking around with a artery that's blocked over 90%, six out of 10 people, okay. and they have no sign of heart disease. They have nothing wrong with their heart. Oh. Yet they're completely blocked, uh -huh. almost. And then completely normal people. In other words, you go up to somebody and say, how are you? I'm fine. Do you yeah. have any health trouble? No, I'm fine. I'm 50 years old. 39% of them have a greater than 90% stenosis of one of their major coronary arteries. So how come? I mean, they, they have a complete blockage. They should have a bypass. Yet they have no worse a prognosis than anybody. Interesting. They're just completely normal. They don't feel anything. Which then gets to the next thing, which is the absolute typical patient that I see now that I'm writing about this. I see at least one or two people who I'm exactly going to describe per week with this situation. So a person doesn't feel well, sometimes short of breath. They walk up hills and it isn't like they used to be. They're 70 years old. So they come for an evaluation. Is this something wrong with my heart? So we do a stress echo and we see that the heart isn't moving like it should, which means there's something wrong with a certain area of the heart. So then they do an angiogram and they find the doctor says, yep, we found a 96% stenosis of this particular coronary artery. And then they say to them uh, almost the same words every time. If this blocks any worse, you're going to have a heart attack and die. Uh -huh. So you need to have a stent or a bypass because nine, if 96%, if this blocks even worse, you're a goner. Now let's think about this for a little bit because this is 90% of the procedures in this country are done with exactly these people. Got it. Let's think about this. So here's a 75-year-old guy, not in the greatest shape, but you know, he's okay. He's walking up hills and he feels a little funny. If he's got 4% blood flow to a major part of his heart, and that's all that the blood flow is to your heart, is through these major vessels, then my question is, if you've got 4% blood flow, how are you even standing or sitting, let alone more or less normally walking up hills? Right, right. 4% is zero. <laughs> that's no blood flow to your heart. If that was the real issue here, how is that even possible? We want to stop for a moment now and thank our sponsors. Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant. Research-based probiotic with human clinical trials on leaky gut. The first 100% spore-forming probiotic that arrives alive in the intestines naturally supports optimal gut health, digestive health, immune health, and delivers antioxidants. Great for adults, kids, the whole family. The probiotic everyone's talking about. Just Thrive Probiotic and Antioxidant. Visit their website at thriveprobiotic.com. And the Nutritional Therapy Association. They train and certify nutritional therapy practitioners, emphasizing whole, properly prepared nutrient-dense food as a key to restoring balance and restoring the body's ability to heal, based on the teachings of Weston A. Price. Learn more at nutritionaltherapy.com. Right. And then the next ludicrous part is, so you mean if you block from 4% to 2%, that's going to kill you? Frankly, 4% is 0% mm -hmm. effectively. And in fact, as the video on Heart Attack New will show you, it's a complete myth that the blood squeezes through the bottleneck. Uh -huh. yeah. In fact, the blood fills retrograde 
And the answer to the riddle of how is this even possible is if you get, if you go to that website, frequently asked questions, riddle solution, you see the normal anatomy of the heart, it looks like a, a fine network of vessels extending over the entire heart, not four coronary arteries. The body is not so stupid to put all its eggs in these four baskets. Got it. In other words, if you block this artery, you're goner. It sets up, even from birth, this interlaced network of fine capillaries so that there's connections, so-called anastomoses, all over the place. So if one area gets blocked, it just does its own bypass. In fact, we now know that the more blockages you have, the more of these capillary collateral vessels you make, and you're more protected. Okay, so I'm, I'm putting all the pieces together in my head. I, I get what you're saying. In other words, the doctor looks at this blockage and says, if it gets any worse, you're going to have a heart attack, so let's put in a stent or you know, clear it out, do what we need to do to make this major highway open up again, for example. But you're saying there are all these other little side roads that the heart knows how to use to compensate for that, and that might not have been the cause of the heart attack because, as you pointed out, people are walking around with all kinds of blockages, and they don't have heart attacks. Exactly. This also got driven home. I did a talk years ago at a Northern California Holistic Heart Symposium. The speaker before me was the head of interventional cardiology at Marin General. He was an older guy. and I think because he was speaking to a holistic crowd, he wanted to sound less surgery-based than he otherwise, or to say something a little bit <laughs> humorous about medicine. Uh -huh. So he, he starts this by talking about when he was in a residency back in Alabama in the 60s, around the time when we were injecting poor black men with syphilis to see what happens. Mm. Uh, not a very pretty story. But what they did was they took these poor black men who came to the hospital with a blockage, with chest pain. They did an angiogram on them. And they identified the ones who had one vessel that was completely blocked. Then they wrote in the chart, if Joe comes back and has a heart attack, which part of the heart will have the heart attack? That's easy, the part that was blocked. Right. So then they said they knew they were going to have a heart attack, so they just sent him home to have a heart attack. So then they could document that it happened in the, part, in the vessel that they said it would. So then they waited. Five years later, some came back and a lot didn't. The ones who came back, less than 10% had a heart attack in the area distributed by the vessel that they set. Oh my gosh. So, so in other words, if they had have done the bypass and the stent or whatever they were doing at that time, it would have done no good because they didn't have a heart attack in that part of their heart anyways. So... There's more, but... Yeah. Uh, okay. But you've set the stage, so can you tell us now what your theory is? What is causing the heart attack if it's not that blockage? So there's other factors here. You know, another curious thing is the small blood vessels. So diabetes, which is a known risk factor for heart attacks, doesn't affect plaque, but it affects small blood vessels. Uh, smoking doesn't affect plaque. It affects small blood vessels. High blood pressure affects small blood vessels. So even our known risk factors, stress, affects small blood vessels, not plaque. So even from a certain point of view, none of those make sense, even though we know there are risk factors, because they don't increase plaque. They deteriorate your small blood vessels. Right. And now we know this because of a test called heart rate variability. So it turns out your heart has a beat obviously, and the beat essentially carries the rhythm of the body. Mm -hmm. Now, in a healthy situation, the beat is neither a metronome, which would be a mechanical device, nor is it a drummer who can't carry a beat. <laughs> Music happens when the drummer, or who's ever carrying the rhythm, the bass player, yeah. has a flexible rhythm. Mm -hmm. It's not a metronome. Then it sounds mechanical. And he does that based on what he's hearing from the orchestra, right. which is what the heart does. It has a flexible rhythm. There's a beat-to-beat -beat variation. 
And when the beat-to-beat -beat variation is lost, either in the direction of being too mechanical like a metronome or too arrhythmical like atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. that's because of a decrease in the parasympathetic nervous system. So what do I mean by that? So we have two nervous systems, the central nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic is the, divided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Sympathetic is fight or flight. There's a bear chasing you, make adrenaline, and squeeze your blood vessels down. Mm -hmm. Parasympathetic is life is good, rest and digest, nourish your organs, mm -hmm. including your heart. Over 95% by testing of people who have heart attacks have a prior decrease in their parasympathetic tone. Mm. So let's think about that. So they're going along, and because of stress, diabetes, poor food, economic insecurity, not enough human touch and warmth, not enough contact with nature, just the American way of life. <laughs> so then they have a essentially decrease in their nourishing parasympathetic nervous system. Now, in the face of that, so if your parasympathetic nervous system is normal and then you have an emotional or physical or psychological stress, that's just life. Mm -hmm. We're meant to be normal and alert and healthy, and then a bear comes and we run. Right. That's life. But if, you're, if your parasympathetic nervous system is chronically stressed through all these reasons, then you have a sympathetic insult Mm -hmm. emotional stress or too much physical activity or something, there's a very specific thing that happens, which is you go from a, a, you have what's called a glycolytic shift. So you start going from a metabolism in your heart cells, in particular, that makes fuel from fats, to now you're making fuel only from glucose. Mm. And what happens with glycolysis or fermentation is it's much more inefficient. It's what's called anaerobic fermentation. Mm -hmm. And we all know that if you go anaerobic, you use glucose and you form lactic acid. Mm -hmm. That's why you get muscle cramps in your leg. Mm -hmm. And so in your leg or in your spleen, you start forming lactic acid, you start feeling the pain in your muscles, and your muscles stop. You stop running because you can't run anymore. Right. And the reason we have that is probably we have two or three minutes to get away from the bear and climb up a tree, and we and then our muscles cramp up, and if you didn't find a tree, you're in tough luck. <laughs> but at least you got a few minutes to get away. The difference with the heart and the brain, and only the heart and the brain, is A, they do about 40% each of the glycolysis, and B, neither of them can stop. Mm -hmm. Your spleen stops, your liver stops, your kidneys stop, your legs stop, everything else, even your eyes don't work as well, but your heart and your brain keep producing lactic acid. The lactic acid causes pain in your heart, which we call angina. Right. And then it gets worse, and that becomes unstable angina. And then you get a localized acid buildup because of the lactic acid, and that's the final step that necrosis or breaks down the tissue, and that's what we call a heart attack. So it sounds like what we need to do is shore up our parasympathetic nervous system so we don't get to that state, right? Yes. And this medicine that this Brazilian guy talked about, it turns out there is a plant called strophanthus. It's an African vine, and in the seeds of it, it makes a chemical called g strophanthine or in the U.S. it's called wabinine. It was identified in the late 1800s. And now it turns out it's an adrenal cortex, which is the seat of the parasympathetic nervous system. It's, it's a copy of a hormone that we make. So it's an endogenous hormone. The plant copies it. And amazingly, the adrenal cortex makes this chemical, or we can take it from the seed, and it goes to the heart and it converts lactic acid into pyruvate, which is the main fuel for the heart. Oh. So it breaks this, this critical step, which is the conversion of the poison that A, causes the pain, and B, then causes the breakdown of the tissue, into the perfect fuel for the heart, 
It also acts as a parasympathetic neurotransmitter. So it does the exact two things that you need a heart medicine to do to prevent and then break this cycle. Wow. Fantastic. It's truly the gift of nature to the heart. And I was just reading, again, these studies are on my website in West Berlin, and because it was the main treatment in Germany for decades for heart disease. And 150 people with angina, all of them were suggestive, stents, bypass, etc. In one week, 124 were angina free, and in two weeks, 146 out of the 150 were free of angina. Wow. Just with a either an extract of the seed or the chemical itself made into a medicine. I can see where that's needed and critical when someone is having that angina or that attack of some sort on their heart. So, but that's like, um, what do they call it? Allopathic? Like that's immediate. Whereas if, like I said, if you could build up your parasympathetic nervous system or, or manage it beforehand so it's in the right state, you might avoid getting to that place altogether. Yes. I mean, in, I mean, I'm a doctor, so I treat people who come to me because they're sick. Uh -huh. and so that's my gig. So I'm a big Strophanthus Wabaheen fan because I treat people who, who need help. But as you say, so nourishing your parasympathetic nervous system is a life of sunshine and direct contact with the earth, high fat, low carbohydrate diet, nourishing tradition diet human physical contact, economic security, uh, ecological balance so that you have regular contact with nature, exactly not what we have right now in our country. So when you do the coronary artery theory, you miss all that. When you see it properly, in my view, you see what a, it's a cultural challenge. You know, the traditional lifestyle was a parasympathetic, friendly lifestyle. Mm -hmm. They worked 18 hours a week. The rest of the time, they ate for fun, told stories, goofed around, and played games. That's how you nourish your parasympathetic nervous system. Right. And we, if we have 18 hours a month where we're just horsing around and having fun and playing games and talking to our friends and telling stories and acting out the latest chase with the pig, you know, <laughs> that would be a lot for most Americans. It's just economic insecurity, stress, social isolation, uh, not to mention smoking, diabetes, low-fat, high-carbohydrate diets. It's a perfect storm for creating parasympathetic collapse. This is very valuable information, Tom, and I hope people check out your website and follow up on some of these really intriguing theories that you have. I want to wrap up by asking the question, if the listener could only do one thing to improve their health, what would you suggest that they do? Take a walk on the beach barefoot with a loved one. I love it. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. My guest today was Dr. Tom Cowan. He was actually our guest on episode number two of this podcast entitled The Deeper Reasons Behind Why People Get Sick. We love his insights and hope you do too. This information is critical for anyone fighting heart disease. If you want to learn more about the heart and get the whole backstory on how Tom developed his revolutionary theory on heart disease and treatment, go to his website, humanheartcosmicheart.com. There you can purchase his book and find other resources. And for highlights of this episode, go to westonaprice.org, click on the word podcast, and look for the show notes for episode 59. Have you been enjoying these podcasts? Have you benefited from them or from the resources on the website or local chapter meetings? If so, please become a member of the Weston A. Price Foundation. It's only $25 for students and seniors and $40 for a general membership. Your contribution is critical for the continued work of the foundation. Wise Traditions is brought to you by the Weston A. Price Foundation for Wise Traditions in Food Farming and the Healing Arts. The content of this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for medical advice.